Um, this is a little, thank you so much for coming to Movable Beast this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a big shout out to Mary Rose who was able to find the space for us at the last moment. Um, So this is the last uh, event of the summer for us. So thank you all for being part of that. And we're gonna, it's been a great summer. And I'm so glad that you all came and share this last event with us. A couple things. Um, Lisa, did you wanna talk real quickly about it? Briefly? Whenever I read. Okay. Okay, well Lisa has an interesting uh, opportunity coming up for writers. Um, to write in Sabina Canyon, and I think she's uh, working on. Also, uh, Joanna Skipsbra, who isn't uh, here this evening, um, she couldn't make it, unfortunately, um, is starting a, this is a lot of thing. Um, it is, is, basically, she's uh, having poets uh, do an event with the Calibri Center of Human Arts, or, or Human Rights, sorry and the Center for Biological Diversity. She's gonna have poets uh, partner with those organizations to write poetry and social justice uh, initiatives. So it's gonna be, yeah, great, great thing. Uh, and she's gonna have, uh, I have her email if you're interested, and we're gonna be posting some of that stuff on the POG social media website soon. Um, so uh, if you're interested, please keep that in mind. Um, there's a lot of poetry going on in Tucson. Um, the Revolutionary Grounds also has an open mic. It's on the first Friday. Oh, yes, Naomi's not here with us this evening, but she does a wonderful thing there. Um, and it's at the first Friday of every month at 5 p.m. at uh, Revolutionary Grounds Coffee. And the Spark Collective has, uh, I have the wrong date here, but um, usually it's the second Saturday of the month they do an event at 6 p.m. and it's also poetry of um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we're on the, the uh, unceded lands of the Tohono O'odham, the Paspayaki, and more further in the past, the Hohokam peoples. And I'm mostly talking about people who look like me, but um, mostly that we would learn to share power uh, and build a new dynamic that we can all love and live in. Um, this is a safe space, so if the directors who are here could raise their hand, uh, it's Lisa and me, I think. Um, if you have anything that uh, makes you feel unsafe, please let us know, and we'll do everything we can to, uh, to address that. And so, COVID and other superbugs. Uh, we, uh, uh, tonight, this isn't such so much a thing, because unfortunately, uh, um, we're inside, but uh, just try and be aware of other people wearing masks, and if they're masking, wear a mask around them, and if they're not masking, don't worry about it so much. So please do that. Um, thank you again for such a wonderful summer, and it's been an absolute pleasure to host these events with you. Um, so, without further ado, uh, could, we, could we all turn off our phones, too? Please. There's Thank going you. to be a recording of this made, so that will be available after the afterwards. Hi, I'm Eric in the Hall of the Days, and I'll be playing some guitar for you.
um, Tess Ajax, she, her pronouns, and this poem was written um, about a year ago, so it's a little bit dated, and you'll see my milk and yawns. I learned today that abortion is essentially illegal in Texas, which brings me to my choices. I chose to become a mother, sort of. It goes without saying, but I'll say it still. I love my child with the death that only a mother knows. But the choice was not mine because I could not make it in my lifetime. The built-in barriers made me wait by design. I had to let the embryo grow six more weeks. And in that time, I changed my mind, manipulated by laws and betrayed by my biology to become a mother before I wanted to be. Clearly, it failed, but I did take plan B. And this is about choosing when I want my life to change, to pass from maiden to mother. It's about respecting that I am capable, and my skills are valuable, and my intellect is sound, and my body is mine. And since giving birth, my hormones are drugs. I'm so blissed out. I usually just feel love and exhaustion. But today, sorrow surges. For the job offer I couldn't take and my inability to cope, I mourn the dreams I carefully packed away, along with my pre-pregnancy wardrobe that fits my old body and my old life. I mourn my lost ability to eat what I want, to smoke what I want, to move without pain, and to birth my child as my ancestors did. And I knew this would be a sacrifice, to share my body and my womb and my breasts and my nipples and my sleep and my bed and my sanity and my future, to be cut open and numb, and to feel strangers unceremoniously tear out my son and to try to heal and raise him in a society that grinds down the community. And so I let my tears fall freely. Sloan sleeps, milk drunk, unaware. I love him, I love him, I love him. But he was thrust upon me by men who get off on control, who wrote laws that require I wait, and all but guaranteed that I would come around to the idea of bringing forth a life that I didn't intend to create. And I did. And I'm here, and he's alive, and I'm alive. The cognitive dissonance was able to subside. But oh, the rage. When I let myself remember who I was before. What my life might have been if my future wasn't decided by monsters who call themselves men, and even worse, women. And little did they know they built their demise. Because once we've healed from our forced births, our vulvas, our pelvic floors, our spirits realigned, we rise. And they're just beginning to see the revolution rising in an involuntary mother's eyes. Thank you.
So um, the other thing that was coming to me was about caps. And who is the caps? I'm, I'm in the lower time, the caps, I'm the bottom. And so these pieces that I chose have to do with that. So, okay. The first piece, um, I'm gonna sit down. The first piece I'm gonna read is by Lucille Lipton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a barrio? Come into the schools, come into the abortion clinics, come into the prisons, come and caress our spines. I say come, wrap your feet around justice. I say come, wrap your tongues around truth. I say come, wrap your hands, your, your, wrap your hands with deeds and prayers. You brown ones, you red ones, you yellow ones, you black ones, you gay ones, you white ones, you lesbian ones, come, 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 come to this battlefield. Come life, come life, come life.
For those of us who live at the shore line, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. For those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways, coming and going in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once, before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to, to silence us, for all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise again in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid we will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome, but when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. to identify me. And as long as I'm confessing, I've never worn capris. 
or have a many pity. Don't even know what it means to thread your eyebrows. Actually, it sounds a bit frightening. Give me thrift store clothes and hiking boots, ID shoved in a pocket with some cash and allergy medicine, and I call myself a woman. that others don't. I see things that others won't. I see things that you can never see. For an INFJ, no surprise, since my first day with baby blue eyes, I always see what I was meant to see. That mountain rising through the trees, that haunting whisper of the breeze, that betrayal I knew was being planned. I see the light, I see the dark. I see your soul as bright and stark. Your shadows are as clear as light to me. I am the seer, I am the seer. Don't turn your eyes from me. Don't close your eyes, can't hide your lies. I've seen your truth, I've seen your proof. I've seen all that I was meant to see. I know your soul, but you can never know me. I only need to see a ray of eyes to know what's at play. Reflected in my eyes, look, Eyes of many turn away. When my gaze on them that lay, they know I've seen what was supposed to hide. When my eyes close, some things I see the way that things are going to be. It isn't always what I hope to dream. Then the eyes that shine so bright turn back on me and all is bright. All your shadows disappear from sight. Because I'm the seer, yes I am. I see righteous, I see damn. Don't try to look away or hide your eyes. I'm the seer, I see all that I was meant to see. Your reflection's in my eyes, if you dare. You'll see what others can see, if you care. When I say, I've seen something come this way, it is something that we all must see, and I count the many times my clear vision was left behind on those who scoffed, the vision fell on them. And my vision's rarely false, always takes the faded course. A lesson learned or not, it's up to you. So when you see eyes, those so blue, that shine their brilliant rays on you. Don't turn away, they're meant to shine on you. 
I'm the seer. I accept my faith. I see the love. I mourn with faith. To see the storm, to know the way to shelter till the storm's at bay. To see the days, to see the nights. I know how to make it right. When to surrender, when to fight. To land in valleys, to reach the heights. Open your eyes, see what I see. I always see what's meant to be. Don't follow lies and fakers' eyes. You'll, they'll eat your soul, cause your demise. See your reflection in their gaze. You'll see how numbered are their days. Let your soul shine from your eyes. Now you're the seer. Now you see wise. Yeah. Oh, look for me on Baker Street. Hot day in LA, California, and I sat at a bench in a small spring factory, counting little springs. How many times I had been sitting or standing somewhere right now in an LA factory had crossed my mind. Sometimes I could find solace from the mindless monotony of labor in music from somewhere. And this time it was a rock station playing a boombox on the shop floor. Familiar song that always caught my imagination because with its distinct opening sound. Then beat, followed by powerful sax, crying to us in mysterious, loud, smooth vibrato, inviting our emotions to visit the misty forest of our nostalgia. Jerry Rafferty's quiet, familiar sounding voice began his story of frustrations that left him wanting to go somewhere else peaceful where he could forget about everything. You got that right, pal. It happens to everybody. It's been 44 years, and it's truer than ever. You could... You could always go to another city, even an even another country then. Today you have to find another planet or galaxy even to escape our shared frustrations. We can never really leave Baker Street for that sun is out and it's a new morning experience. If you can never go to sleep, you can never wake up to a new sunny morning. The night has gone longer and longer and cannot sleep. And looking for a place where the sun sneaks its rays between dark clouds and those places are disappearing fast. My dream is to lie in that sunny spot and hear the haunting, joyful sounds of Raphael making love to a saxophone, a sound that has drifted to all corners of the universe with its soulful message. You can hear it coming from faraway galaxies that reverberates throughout the universe. You can hear it coming, oh, I just said, you can find you can find comfort in Jerry's whispering words that resonate with our hearts and minds. We can dream of the sunny new morning. Until then, we are lost in the night on Baker Street. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And we're just going to take about 10 minutes for an intermission, and then we'll be back with the second half. Thank you so much. Hi. How's everyone feeling? Thank you for that confirmation drop. So, <laughs> I do do that. If you guys want to come and support, they have awesome coffee and tea. I'm a sucker for going. So, if you guys want to come and join me, that'd be great. Um, a little bit about me. <laughs> um, I'm very spiritual in nature with my writing. I'm currently writing a manuscript. And it's about... Thank you. We're, been, we're, been, we're going through it. <laughs> so, it's been about... The ego, right, and the humanity of the ego, and what happens when you detach from that. 
the light versus the dark. And then from there, I want to make seven books all about the chakras and aligning yourself with the opposite of the chakra and then, you know, the highest version of it. So I only have one poem tonight, but um, I'm sure you guys are going to love it. <laughs> Why do we suffer? Is it because that's all we know, all we are? Why do you suffer? Have you challenged why you are alive, why you cry, laugh, feel sadness and joy? Do you feel the birth and death of yourself in every breath? Have you felt the wind kiss your skin, let the sun guide you to a place where you feel self-worth? Do you ask yourself, what have I learned? Have you made promises to change but have no idea how, frozen with fear, can you even trust yourself to try? What would you feel like without a single doubt in your mind? When I ask we, why we as a whole suffer, I truly ask, why do you? Are you willing to keep passing it on? Another generation of sorrows and insecurities is here because we are too embarrassed to accept or validate anything other than our ego. Vulnerability is not shameful. Neither are your emotions. When you take a deep look inward, what truth is your suffering showing you? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. set a timer really quick so I don't go over. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, some poems from uh, a, a book of poems that I'm working on called The Border Simulator. And, thanks. Um, and there's like some, a little bit of background. Um, there's two characters, Primitivo and his sister Primitiva and their voices are kind of intertwined throughout these poems with uh, a character called Customs, which sort of stands in for Customs Agents and other things. Um, yeah, and their voices are sort of intertwined through their Primitivo and Primitivo are trying to cross the border and uh, they have a lot of interactions with Customs, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Somehow, you've been able to separate yourself from yourself. Where are the jobs? In the desert? You know that place. Your body tells you not to, and yet you cross, you cramp. Is this the mind leading the body? You'll have to woo customs if you want to live, die, work in the border simulator. You already live, die, work at the meat fabrica. It's all one and the same here. Here is the desert. Here is the steeple. It's like your shampoo conditioner, two in one. But that doesn't make sense. How can two fit into one? Have you heard this one before? Wouldn't the bottle overflow with foamy conditioner? Yes, that's what the conditions are like here. Your papers flow out your gills. No te creas. You've never seen a fish. How could you become one? Even though this desert was once literal, you can see water rings on the mountains. It's literal sand that this meat fabrica was built on. I promise I can't fabricate a lie. I know the denim fabric I used to make your bedazzled jeans so well. I sewed my name and number on the inseam. If found, come get me. Uh, this one is called No Pares Sigue Sigue. It's named after uh, like a 90s dance hall hit that they play at quinceañeras. 
Uh, your eyes are a revolving entrance for Customs. Customs is trying to open, putting the people's eyes, but he's doing everything he can to keep them shut. Primitivo sold his ojitos to Customs, but now has second thoughts and doesn't want to give them up. Customs wants to look like Primitivo, to stamp other crossers with familial eyes. This is the state of the state of your eyes, and they're wild with dunes. Let us climb. But to climb, we'll need words we understand on a map. Customs are words that describe themselves, an example of map design. Their ancestors, whoops, acne scars, are scatter plots, replacing latitude and longitude with other dimensions like time and dollar sign. The crossers represented by dots. The same, that same crosser should serve more than one graphical purpose. You think that's a lot of information for just one dot. Oh look, there's another dot. And when you connect them, you get the face of Primitivo. Please paint that face in my mural. These crossers are not restrictive stories. We know so much about them, and still they try and sneak narratives away from us. Stories we can use to catch more of them. Treasure mine, trash yours. So um, in, in kind of uh, writing, doing like edits to this uh, a book, I'm trying to write a uh, sort of a beginning that accepts the world for the reader, kind of introduces the characters a little bit. Uh, so that's uh, what I'm gonna read now, at least kind of like earlier poems that are now in the manuscript. Uh, this is called, Do Primitivo and Primitiva Ever Meet in the Manuscript? The border simulator is made of narratives that have passed inspection. Poems that have rivers have their wives stream down holographic mountains to reach the lower valley's work floor. This brother and sister duo, Primitivo and Primitiva, are parts of a border simulator story that exist versus invented stories, and the stories are looking for work. They're dots on the same map, but do the dots ever meet? Do Primitivo and Primitiva ever meet in the manuscript? I know they're related, but do we need to see them together? Maybe we don't see them physically, but does one find evidence of the other? Primitiva speaks. Primitivo wrote me a letter, and this is what he said. He discovered from all his years crossing for work. In the border simulator, you're a crosser and customs at the same time. Have we arrived at the sunset of the border? Has customs finally found us curled up in Texas? I've reached for you for the last time, Primitivo. I am entering the border simulator as customs, rotten dough as rotten seas or something like that. I can't translate. I can't see well in English. Even though I can't see, they told me I was a seer, a goer. And by joining customs, I attempt to outlive my life. I could die as a crosser, but still live as customs in the border simulator. We're riding a stallion through the border, and the horse of the border is primitivo. Uh, this is uh, titled, I've turtled my name and gargled my voice, and now I want to taste Texas. Something like dollar signs make the border simulator work. It's a kind of recital that we can only get from Primitivo and Primitiva. We need the reps so bad. Inject these narratives into my veins. Primitivo is a digital desert. We accompany him through Metal Gear-like codex screens. Customs in one box asking Primitivo for his ID. We created rooms for our IDs, a room that Primitivo is not even in, but his future is. Primitivo is a jungle native, but not a digital native. We learned this about him and ourselves through the journey to the portals of the north. What we learned about Primitiva, she's crossed here before. Primitiva is the copy pasta of the border. We've seen Primitiva, but we don't remember her. 
We've seen so many copy pastas since we first saw her, but what we can't figure out is which agency sends Primitiva to us and who writes and then boils these copy pastas. For first you make the pasta and then you make its copy. The wind blows through several flags at the border. The desert wind blows through our teeth and we catch sand in the gaps of our teeth, all part of the crossing, hand in hand and whatnot. If you press play on the cassette player, this is what you'll hear. We're weaving the jungle. No, sorry, leaving the jungle for simulation. You can have it. We're leaving for desert, for if we can ride bikes through the jungle, we can ride them through the simulator in the desert. We can just create more primitivas or less if we need fewer crossers. These borders are yours, but mostly ours to define. It's a job. Defining borders. Can I write defining in a resume? I'm not welcome to apply, and yet I welcome loans and interest payments. What I can't define is how the agency creates the copy pasta of me and my sister. What comes first, the pasta or the copy? Who crosses first, primitivo or primitiva? Or so I thought I wanted to taste Texas, but now I'm negging on my promise to join you in telling our story through a narrative mural. I'm tired of representations. I don't want to present anymore. I've forgotten how to use PowerPoint. The smugglers will promise a safe passage through the border, but the reality is much different. Primitivo doesn't know it, but he's obnoxious to the border. Primitivo is unaware he's obnoxious to the fence. The fence is tired of Primitivo and all his Pedialyte and tuna cans. The fence is tired of Primitivo and how he hides inside its words. The words of the crossers have become skunked. We know other words for crossers, ones we won't use here. Okay, well here's a few. Wet crosser, dry crosser, bedazzled denim rosser. See how I just fit one word inside another? Anyone can sneak these words past. Customs tuts when she hears my answer. If I can sneak words into the border simulator, you bring a few words. Can sneak yourself in and get a job moderating content for the ominous sounding app TikTok. Hurry, the border needs moderating and so does the app. For most people, the border simulator is the border. We have a cousin who's a level two moderator. He gets the Rossers, those who cross to shop at Ross, that made it past moderator one. Level one moderators see the most explicit border cross attempts, all waves in the border simulator app. And the waves are made of caravans of crossers. Don't be afraid of hiding in the Coyotes 1986 Dodge caravan. We leaned into each other in the back seat, sending SMSs to Coyote banks. The dollar signs eventually travel through wind chutes. You know those hydraulic tubes? I wish I could travel through hydraulic tubes. I wish I was a dollar. It seems, snicker, my dollar signs, my genes, have no borders and seem to have more agency than me or my sister. And now I see the appeal Primitiva chases, for if you're an agent, then surely you have agency. Someone's bank is receiving us, our money, but we're not sure whose. In the 90s, we were riding a horse through the 8-bit border, and the horse of the border was Primitivo. We're riding a stallion through the border simulator, and the stallion of the border is Primitivo's story. Where is his narrative going? Do we follow the story, or has the narrative been following us this whole time? We thought we were following the story of Primitiva, but her narrative was following us. Was following us, customs, and now she's caught up to us. She wears our uniform and speaks our language. She also speaks your language, dear Crosser. Okay, uh, so one more. Thank you, thank you. And thank you again to David and to Movable Beast. I think this is an awesome, an, uh, uh, an awesome event.
Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. So, uh, last one. Primitivo crosses for work, and his work is the crossing. His job is to watch for glitches and then patch them. Y por eso se llama patches. This interruptive spiral of silence. This spiral is so quiet, I didn't see it interrupting us. We tap into Primitivo and know what he's about to say. We can even make Primitivo say the things we want him to say. People far away from the border ask, has Texas been to you yet? Primitivo is both inside, yet somehow still outside the border. He thought he arrived ipso facto, but it's all thresholds from here on out. Primitivo and Primitiva are supposed to meet in the manuscript, but they're not sure how. They're a border they've never crossed. To come out of the cult of the border and actually demonstrate that you are out of it. Why were we willing to chase the tail of the border? All crossers go to heaven. That's what we were told anyways. But the reality was much different. We kept sending angels and customs sent the angels back. It's not really that you're talking in the border simulator. You're really just posting statements on a stage. Customs feeds themselves the fence. We are now so full from watching customs eat the fence. Their language is so big, we were able to shuttle ourselves into their language. We were told we could take refuge in the language of customs. We were trying to chase the narrative, but we were confused as to where the narrative was going. Did the narrative have a getaway car waiting? Who's trying to kidnap this narrative? Or did the narrative, as implied above, try to kidnap itself and hold itself hostage for ransom? If the narrative took itself hostage, then that means it wants a way out. The narratives always get painted into the corner of the Southwest because the Southwest is also in a corner tucked away and safe in its trap. It's not crazy to want a border. We all want to bracket time for yourself and your loved ones. Put the ones you love into brackets. It's the only way to be sure. Because if you're in a bracket, you're trapped, but also protected. And who doesn't love being protected by a trap? You could step on the trap, but so could they. Thank you. I'm really fucking short. So I'm just gonna do this. Hi, I'm Mary Rose Larkin. I am a poet. I am not a member of any organization, but I am a special advisor to Movable Beast. And one of the thoughts I like about Movable Beast is, one of the reasons I'm so interested when David started talking about it is, I believe in failing over and over again. Um, it's the only way I'm going to become a better writer. And this is a great place where you can fail if you feel like it. Like, and that's really important to know, so if you have something you want to do, and you think you're going to fail, look us up. <laughs> could be amazing, could be terrible. Samuel Beckett said fail. No, fail better. Um, so, but as a relationship to that, I am trying to feel better myself. And the way I'm doing it is, 
So, anything I don't really like that I've written, I put on my blog, I put on my blog while I'm doing things. I just, sometimes publishing is the best way to kill a poem so you can move forward, but then you have a lot of like, I wouldn't call them crappy. I would call them unadventuresome poems. And for me, the, the for me, I've always been cultivating sort of this deep stillness within writing. And I'm beginning to lose interest. So I'm more thinking about manifesto and velocity these days. And the way I'm relating to that is by rewriting everything that wasn't what I define perfect. And this is one of those poems this poem used to be called First Aid, and now it's called Wind Sun. I'm going to do my glasses thing because I'm an old person. Wind Sun, growing golden salt, shimmers dappled in sulfur and adrenaline, autumn prophes. I'm growing a history with a week, late winter stuck in my eye. When we all believed in feathers splayed out, pyramids and jaundice, the resistance between now and now, words, all manners and industries, pain-shaped sun where wings would be if there were wings. I know it's an imperfect system. I breathe it into all my sentences, the doves flying into the present, the past spinning off a page, a ragged flutter. Here the first, less thought and less sorrow and more impeccable azure, more practice here under exile, to root a ring of rosy, to root the pintails on the tile, to root the ribs of the new to my hands. And the other one, it used to be a piece called uh, Lavender Pit. It's about the Lavender Pit and Bis Bisbee. Many things happened in my poem about the Lavender Pit. One is, the misinterpretation of artifacts. So if we look at the lavender pit as an artifact that's unknown to us, could it be a form of music? Could highways, the sound you make on highways, be a form of music? So it was a big poem about that. It had a lot about the Bisbee labor strikes and how they pulled everybody up and took them and dumped them in Denning, New Mexico to essentially walk back. Um, doesn't have any of those things now. So, it's now called Every Origin Story Music. Fruit before fruitful, or earth before lightning, horizon a striped strike from the fifth heaven. Are we self-machines, or are we the present? Or dovetailed stars and tarmac? Copper writes to the east, his notation strata illegible, his every origin music is every threshold sky. Thanks. And now you will watch me leave the stage. <laughs>
two love poems tonight, and I'm going to start with one, and I'm going to end with one. <laughs> and they're both from my wonderful partner, Jamie. <laughs> First one um, is a bit hard to explain, but um, there is a secret poem which I wrote only for Jane, and um, I promise never to be read. <laughs> but it was really good, so I wanted to somehow write about it. So I wrote a poem about that poem, <laughs> and this is that poem, and it's just called Love Poem. <laughs> I like your story about Strega Nona, the magical Italian spaghetti witch. I like my new hand-me-down Swiss cousin, who you and I should really visit in Zurich. I wrote my poem, the Elvis Handbook and Operational Manual. I wrote it only for you, from cut-up words and a disappearing notebook. It felt like homework, being human all the time. I was feeling bored and wished you'd knock at the door. Um, some of these poems are included in a, in a chapbook, which I'll example for you here. <laughs> um, I have merchandise, it's in the back. <laughs> if you like what you hear, um, those are for sale for eight dollars. <laughs> and this is a poem from, from that book. There, there's a few. It's called My Friends. Abigail is an optometrist. Brandon is a barista. Cherise is also an optometrist. <laughs> Dakota is from South Dakota. <laughs> Esther is an envelope technician. Franklin is a stagecoach driver of the previous century. Gerald prefers Jerry. Harriet is a horticulturalist. Isaac isn't interested. Justine is weird. Kay is more than an initial Larry served two tours. Melanie, of Melanie's Sweet Sixteen Boutique and Dress Shop. <laughs> Nadine, originally from Bushwick. Olaf, with a lisp, is four and a half. Penelope, of course, and all her suitors. Quincy, oh Quincy. Roger refurbishes furniture. Stephen is a drummer. Talia is French-Canadian. Uma. Well, who knows? Virginia is from North Dakota. <laughs> Wilhelm II, Xerxes I, Yolanda calculates space time, Zane smoking their cigarette. Greeting cards, little amplifier tentacles, Old Testament dune buggies, spelling bees, specters of the fog, I conquer bog monsters, battle scars, satin scarves, centenarians practicing their kickflips. I build and maintain ball pits in forgotten boroughs of the city, a city called Harrisburg, the state capital. I wrote this poem at, I wrote this poem for Tyler, and Tyler is in the crowd. It's called Wealth. Regular millionaires, run-of-the-mill regular millionaires. 
I'll tell you, following their money becomes very boring. It's all about property in the end, and the proper places for things. Their golden tablets, old golden bracelets, their amphibious golden tennis shoes. Following their complaints becomes a chore. They detest paying taxes, and do so anyway with counterfeit tokens of the future. What millionaires touch becomes a window just for them. The windows in my house aren't windows at all. Instead, they show images of millionaires' children having fun and laughing, playing expensive-looking games of stickball. My friends and I sit inside, sulking, counting our beans. <laughs> This is a poem about Star Trek, and um, it was published in a magazine um, called The Baffler, and I was really happy to be in the magazine and have this poem in it. And, and it was kind of like a Star Trek um, whole issue, which I didn't know. <laughs> Spock's brain is lost somewhere in the galaxy, stolen by the terrible androids of Omicron 9. Space aliens, dangerous sirens, libidinal and lust crazy, with weaponized utility bracelets, screenplays of the 60s. Bugs Bunny, aka the masked marauder, doesn't live in Sherwood Forest, that's Robin Hood. But Bugs does wield a carrot half-eaten and pointed like a pistol, someplace in the desert. Eventually, Spock gets his brain back, wearing a shade of purple eyeliner Jay says she likes. I fall asleep in the desert and dream of Sherwood Forest, myself encamped among trees that form an impressive 401k, yet wake with barely bagel money. When my grandmother died, my family bought her a star, or bought the name of a star to honor her memory, J98670KL3000, <laughs> coordinates of a distant place, already gone by now. This is a tough one. <laughs> um, I wrote a review of a, of a new book by the poet Anselm Berrien, and it's somebody I like a lot, and I like their work a lot. I've been wanting to write a review for a long time. Um, and I wanted to somehow um, brag about the fact that I wrote this review. <laughs> but you can't really read um, essays at poetry meeting. So instead, I thought I would do a cover. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read a poem of Anselm's called "Regrets." And in this book, all of the poems are sorted into titles that are either regrets, pregrets, or degrets. And this is just standard old regret. <laughs> I regret not knowing what time it's ever been. I regret not painting not the bathroom on your white walls in big indigo letters. I regret the faint of leaning in in that death by snake landscape that was collage. I regret all kinds of nothings, little beautiful timidities. I don't long view regret. It was a they, we had added up. You have to give people the space you didn't know how to take. You don't, you're a sorting mechanism. You're not actually all slime. You're a very fierce, frail piece of guy. Supposedly, you didn't turn around the last time Dad said goodbye. Who needs to notice? You being yourself don't quite work your shit out loud. Enough for the novelistic every fucks. Sunny, helmet kiss on forearm, light repulsion at deep night, come all over the courtly pre-imagined. My interest in desperation lies only in that sometimes I find myself having become desperate. I know ghosts. They're being ordered about, 
fucked as ever by limitation. A book the size of your fingers told me to force it, so, so I say a damned thing with love crushed to bring out flavor. Your look at me keeps feeling space filled with massive non-participation. Then bodies force you to appear to measure out the exacting space to not die in or be non-dead already. Um, I'm going to read this poem because Gabe likes it, and, um, and it has a twist, so get ready. A, a letter from the coast. Seeking the smell utterly delightful of far-flung oils and extravagant perfumes which together constitute the fact of my cachet, I arrived upon this unknown shore. A keen wind blew as if released from a miniature giant's coin purse. There lay, partly submerged in the sand, seashells as large as motorcycle sidecars, and I knew not my location amid the lagoons. Damn that coachman who deposited me so unceremoniously at the riverhead. The sun above was dressed in tatters, and the crabs all scuttled to their parlor rooms. From my rucksack I withdrew my pistol, a gift of my late employer's daughter. Oh, my darling Martha, if only I were with you now. Yet the pistol would not fire, and skeerings, it seemed, were clotted with barnacles. I am more than anything a man of letters. I have, with the power of will, threaded licorice straws through the eye of a needle. Still, I heard the death knell of my fate echo along the coastline. I stumbled, lost to despair, near kibble from the seabirds. In my trouser pocket, I found a crumpled sheaf of paper. I wrote my name upon it. I wrote. Thomas Jefferson, a nobody. <laughs> and this is my last poem. And um, thank you again um, to everybody and for the reading. It's been, again, a, a real pleasure. Trails tracing typos, piercing clouds, needles and thread. On our way, horses look funny, bug-eyed, their fly masks on. There's a man with a dog tucked under his arm, stopped on his bike chatting with a car. A woman on our left-hand side, pushing a grocery cart, box of beer underneath, another dog sitting up in the basket. And so, thinking it over, in spitting distance of love, while also holding it here, every parking lot either empty or full, sounds of traffic, susurrus of traffic, I will talk too much. I will talk. I will write in my journal only one thing, Look, clouds blowing fast. Thanks. <laughs>
The next one is probably going to be in October, probably the third Friday of the month in October. Um, we don't have anything firm on that yet. But, um, and it will probably be here. And it will probably be here, yeah. But, um, and we'll put it on Poetry in Tucson Facebook, and we'll send out all sorts of stuff and share it around. So thank you so much. Have a great